welcome back to my channel. My name is Muriel and in this video I will be doing my bookshelf tour 2022 edition. I did my very first bookshelf tour in July of 2021 and it was quite a bit of fun for myself and hopefully it was enjoyable for you all. But the thing is quite a few things have changed with regards to my bookshelves, with the way I organize my books, with well the books themselves, so I thought I might do an updated version of a bookshelf tour. So like with the first one I did in 2021, I will basically start by showing the entire shelving unit first. So I have five shelving units in total. I'll show the shelving unit proper, explain kind of how I organize my books according to well, shelving units and like cube. I call them cube, you know what it is, I call them cubes, whatever. And then I'll go over the books themselves, won't go into too much detail for any one of them except maybe I don't know, some I haven't really talked about on the channel before, or maybe I'll showcase some editions, covers and things like that. Otherwise, you know, don't expect too much detail. However, if you want more details, just ask me in the comments down below. So as you might have guessed, this is the shelving unit in front of which I film all of my videos, or I mean all my book related videos in any case, and it is, well, my principal fiction shelving unit. The top left and top right, I call them cubes, those are meant for basically fiction standalones, both speculative fiction and literary fiction. I also have a few memoirs in there. The top middle one is my Le Guin cube. Yes, I now have one because of course I needed one. Bottom left and bottom right are basically reserved for SFF series because I mean, well actually I'm going to read something that isn't speculative fiction and it will be a trilogy. Anyway, I'll worry about that when I get to it, but so basically series, so duologies and above. At the minute there are a few Le Guin stuck down there because I don't think I have any more bookends. Those will technically go at some point up above with the rest of my Le Guin's, but they're there for now. Bottom middle are basically the children's book series or young YA book series that, you know, have a special place in my heart and so I've decided to keep them. Middle left is the same as it was before, it is my Song of Ice and Fire cube. Middle right is an assortment of important works of SFF, or I mean important to me, so my Tolkien's are there, Miss of Avalon is there, and the very middle cube is my Je Vandermeer and Mievel shelf. Yes, I now have one because I figured if I have one for A Song of Ice and Fire, if I have one for Le Guin, I must have one for my two other favorite authors of all time, the great weird fiction writers that are Jeff Vandermeer and China Mievel. So with this first basically more or less all fiction shelving unit, I'm going to go from left to right and top to bottom. A quick reminder that I basically only keep novels that I've rated with a 7 out of 10 or above. There are of course a few exceptions that I've kept because they have a special significance to me emotionally or in my reading history, things like that, and of course I'll point them out as I go along. So we have The Book of Dragons, this is an anthology featuring short stories and even some poetry about my favorite mythological creature of all time, the dragon. And in a fair few subgenres as well, there is both fantasy and science fiction in here, and it was a surprisingly good anthology. There are also a few illustrations in this style in this book, so I would definitely recommend this one if you are dragon nerd like me. Then there's a new all-time just as a favorite really. I plonked it in fantasy rather than science fiction but um it's not a very uh, determined plonking is how I'm going to put it. So it is Hollow Kingdom written by Kira Jane Buxton and this is SC with a chroming character and I think it's a lovely cover too and well I've decided to treat myself to hardbacks of new favorites if I can't otherwise you know, find a special slash deluxe edition for it. And of course there's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland from Lewis Carroll, Angela Carter's The Bloody Chamber, which I reread last year I believe, there's The Book of the Unnamed Midwife written by Meg Allison, there is Under the Skin written by Michelle Faber that I read at the end of last year, there's Herland and The Yellow Wallpaper written by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Again, just like last time, I haven't really 
talked about this one much. It's basically a story of proto-feminist utopian writing, kind of, and also the story of a woman who kind of goes insane, the yellow wallpaper. It's quite a good story. Herland, it's not so much that I liked it, but it was definitely interesting to my, you know, feminist and SFF nerd self. There's The Witch's Heart, written by Genevieve Gornishek, another new, now all-time favourite work of literary fantasy. The Magician is written by Lev Grossman, and I really like this edition as well. I love this kind of watercolour of a tree, though now I kind of want it in hardback, so if I can find this edition in hardback, I will probably splurge and get it. Onto another new literary fiction favourite this time, Elinor Oliphant is completely fine, written by Gail Honeyman. And I bought this physical copy while I was in London. Also, I should have specified, I have a fair few book reviews for a lot of the books I'm going to show. So I have one for Eleanor Oliphant, I have one for The Magicians, I kind of have one for The Witch's Heart, I have one for Under the Skin, and well, I obviously have a rave one for Hollow Kingdom, so if you want to check those out, they're on my channel. <laughs> Moving on, we have Rave New World and by Aldous Huxley. This is my favourite of the classical dystopians, as I call them. There's Never Let Me Go, written by Kazuo Ishiguro. It's another dystopian I quite liked, I found it very very moving. I will probably reread it at some point, though perhaps not next year. There's Girl Trapped It, written by Susanna Kaysen. This is a story of a young woman who probably had borderline personality disorder, if I remember correctly, or depression or something. It's kind of based on her psychiatric file when she was hospitalized on a psych ward. I read this in the phase I had where I wanted to read about, well, mental illness in literature. I'm not convinced I liked it that much, though, so I might just unhaul it. I shall see. Then we have Lady Chatley's Lover, written by H. Lawrence. So this is one of those exceptions. I don't actually like it that much, but it has this weird special place in the development of my identity as a bookworm shall we say? Plus I have highlighted passages in it and okay, I mean it's kind of a suggestive cover but I think it's funnily suggestive, know what I mean? So I'm just keeping that one because yeah, it has significance to me as a reader, but I don't actually really like the story that much anymore. And then there's Solaris, written by Stanislav Lem. It's not really a favourite, it just skirts that 7 out of 10 rating, but it has stuck in my mind. It's a very strange story, it's kind of weird fiction in its own way, and yeah, it was memorable is what I'll say, so that's why I kept it. Then I'll move on directly to the upper left shelf. So these are my three H.P. Lovecraft anthologies, and I love these Penguin Modern Classics editions. Though, as you can see, it's like several different generations of them. <laughs> I have one of each. I think that's kind of amusing. Then there's Atonement, written by Ian McEwen. I plan on reading this one next year as well. Then my two Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita, which is my favourite literary fiction novel of all time. And then there's Ada or Arda, which I also really liked. I should probably reread it as well, though. I both love and hate this cover. If you're familiar with some of the history I've shared in other relevant videos, you'll understand why. Uh, so much could be said about this cover. Uh, yeah, I love it and hate it at the same time because it's inappropriate in so many ways, but at the same time, it, it's kind of edgy, I guess. <laughs> and I really liked it as a teenager, but you know, for the wrong reasons. Then my three Anais Nins, so there's Delta, Venus and Little Birds, those are her erotica short stories. Then there's Henry and June, so it's a bunch of excerpts from some of Anais Nin's diaries. Then there's obviously George Orwell's 1984. Here again, it's an exception. I didn't actually really like it that much, but it's one of those classic dystopians, though, I mean, arguably I could have kept Fahrenheit 451 as well based on that, but I guess I still kind of prefer that one, maybe. Also, I think it's a neat edition, so. Yeah. And here we have Women on the Edge of Time, written by Marsh PC. So this is feminist, utopian, and dystopian science fiction, which I read a while ago. I remember really liking it, but once again, I plan on rereading it next year. And then, well, The Bell Jar, written by Sylvia Plath, a poignant novel about the experience of severe clinical depression. This bitch! <laughs> Uh, yes, Normal People, written by obviously Sally Rooney, a new very strong literary fiction favourite that I adored for very personal and idiosyncratic reasons. You can learn more about this in my dedicated book review for it. And so we come to My Dark Vanessa, uh, written by Kate Elizabeth Russell. You all know what this is about. I've talked a lot about this one as well in relationship to Lolita and on its own. And another <laughs> new all-time science 
science fiction favorite, Elder Race, a novella written by Adrian Tchaikovsky, magnificent representation of what it is like to experience severe clinical depression, and also plays around with Arthur C. Clarke's third law of science fiction. And then at the back of the first shelf I showed, so we have The Priory of the Orange Tree written by Samantha Shannon. I enjoyed it well enough to keep it, and I'm sorry, this is one of the most gorgeous paperbacks I own, just straight up. Then we have The Color Purple, written by Alice Walker, beautiful literary fiction novel. And then Prose Animation, written by Elizabeth Wurzel. I do believe this is a memoir about depression and taking antidepressants. I need to reread this or just unhaul it. And finally, Putney, written by Sofka Zinoviev, another literary fiction favorite for personal and painful reasons. And I think this is superior to My Dark Vanessa, at least on some metrics. And if you enjoyed My Dark Vanessa, I would definitely recommend you check this one out. I should also have on these two shelves the memoir Le Consentement by Vanessa Springora, otherwise known as Consent in English, which is a memoir, again, about this stuff. <laughs> and I do have a review for that one if you're interested, but at the minute my mum is reading it, that's why it's not on my shelves. So now I'm going to go over my favourite authors of all time slash series of all time shelves. So first there is the Ursula K. Le Guin shell. So we have Worlds of Exile and Illusion. This is a bind up of three separate novellas, I guess, taking place on the planet Wakanun and Altera, I think, if I remember correctly. Then we have The Word for the World is Forest. Then there's The Eye of the Heron, also another novella. Oh shit, I actually lied. Well, <laughs> no, I didn't lie, but I made a mistake. I don't actually have a copy of The Beginning Place. I did, but I unhauled it because I really did not like it. So, oops, I guess that's missing from my collection, but I have in fact read it. So I have read, as far as I know, all of the Wood's published fiction. Then we have The Lathe. I think it's pronounced Lathe of Heaven. Then The Dispossessed, one of Le Guin's most acclaimed novels. Not my favorite though, my favorite is, well, you'll know, it's The Left Half of Darkness. Then we have Always Coming Home, and I do have a review for that. I also have a review for The Wings Swap Quarters and The Compass Rose. This is basically, you know, an SF masterworks, a big bind up of a lot of her short stories. Then we have The Birthday of the World and Other Stories. It is my favorite short story collection by S. K. Le Guin. I reread it this year and I have a dedicated book review for it. And as you can see, my copy hasn't aged that well because basically the title is disappearing from the spine. Then my original editions, well actually they were my dad's, I think. Was I gifted them by my half sister when I was a child? I can't remember. Anyway, they're old editions of, well, the Earthsea novel, or at least the first four of them. As you can see, I have later editions of Tales from Earthsea and The Other Wind. And so this is the latest one I've read, completing my reading of Asakelegwit's fiction, I believe. So Orsinia, which is basically literary fiction set in an invented country. And at the back, there are the three novels of the Annals of the West and Shore. This is Le Guin's YA trilogy, or I mean some people consider A Wizard of Earthsea YA, or children's fiction. These are definitely meant for teenagers, I think. I read them when I was myself a teenager. And that's actually another novel aimed at younger readers. It's Lavinia. It's actually, you know what, <laughs> it is a mythological retelling that dates from a time when those things were not yet as popular as they are today. It is a mythological retelling of basically the Aeneid, told from the point of view of Lavinia, who became Aeneas's wife. And so, of course, we have My Song of Ice and Fire shelf. This literally hasn't changed <laughs> since, well, my first bookshelf tour. So, you know, you have the main set. And at the back, there is the land of Ice and Fire. It's basically the, the map thing, so it's not really a book. It's a case with lots of maps in it, because I love me some fancy maps. There is the World of Ice and Fire, the big world building info book. That is just delicious if you're into that shit. And of course, there are the graphic novels. I probably added the first two graphic novel adaptations of A Clash of Kings since last time, but so I absolutely love these graphic novel adaptations. And um, Ahem. They'll probably be the most accurate visual adaptations we're going to get for A Song of Ice and Fire. And there are the Duncan X stories, so that's A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms. Not my favorite, but I enjoyed them well enough. Now, I do have a Fire and Blood, like, <laughs> excuse me, I am a Song of Ice and Fire nerd. Of course I have it, but I've lent it to my dad. Oh, and yes, I also have this awesome art book that features lots of illustrations dedicated to A Song of Ice and Fire. It's called Drawing with the Pointy End. Love the title, and uh, it was well worth the investment on Kickstarter. It probably was at the time. And then we have my new Vandermeer slash Miegel shelf. I've basically done a selection of some of my favorites, because I also have some in the back, as you can see. Uh, so they're... 
there isn't much rhyme or reason to the order here. Some Mievel, some Vandermeer. I mean, the problem is these two bitches are very chunky, so yeah, they take up a lot of space. But obviously, so these are the first two novels in his Baslag trilogy. Then two other favorites. Kraken and Embassy Town. Embassy Town is so good though, please, if you enjoy high caliber science fiction, playing around with linguistic relativity, the best way I've encountered so far, go for that one, it's really good. And then some Vandermeers, I do have Venice Underground, so I have those three together because they're the same types of editions. They're very pretty editions too, but they don't actually go together technically, because Venice Underground is its own story. And then we have City of Saints and Madeline, and Shriek and Afterward, the first two books in the Ambergris trilogy. Why the hell is Finch not published in this edition? <clears throat> oh, it's so annoying. And then, of course, the Southern Reach trilogy, one of my favorite works of science fiction of all time. And I'm hiding in the back. <laughs> so we have the third book in the Baslag trilogy, Iron Council. It's my least favorite, so I figured, yeah, it can go in the back, though. Look at that pretty purple spine, am I right? And then we do have Finch in this new edition they released and so now these two are also released in that edition but i was like ah should i buy them so they match Pfft. no <laughs> i resisted the urge there then there's born the strange bird and then there's jeff vanamir's latest novel for adults at least i mean that's salamander i do have a dedicated book review for that one if you're interested and just look at that cover isn't that a beautiful cover it is a beautiful cover come on <laughs> I have read Dead Astronauts, I did not like it at all. It did have a pretty cover too though, but just too experimental for my taste. So moving on, this is basically a miscellaneous assortment of favorite SFF series, kinda. So we have my cherished collection of uh, Tolkien books illustrated by Alan Lee or Ted Nasmith in the case of The Silmarillion. I love these, they make me happy. <laughs> uh, but I'm tray sad that don't have the Legend of the King. I also really freaking want the Alan Lee illustrated Unfinished Tales, but it's only available in hardback. What's up with that? And it's been out for two years. A paperback version should have been released by now and it hasn't, so I'm very miffed about that. What the hell? Then we have some of my Avalonian series novels. My favorite being, of course, The Mists of Avalon. It's my favorite fancy novel of all time. The Forests of Avalon is probably my second favorite. Lady of Avalon was a right, and I should have the other two in the back there. So I think I have Ravens of Avalon, which is basically a story around Queen Boudicca, and Priestess of Avalon, which is about Emperor Constantine's mother, I think. I mean, you know, they form a set. That's why I've kept them, but honestly, this one is, is my favorite. And then in the back we have the Rain of Fire Hexology. I think that's the name of it. It's a series I read a long time ago. It's a series I should probably read at some point, you know. <laughs> Same formula over and over again. These are stories told entirely from the points of view of dragon characters. And they're not anthropomorphized dragons. And it was just so special with lots of different kinds of humanoids too involved. I don't know, I really liked them when I read them. They kind of have that special sweet spot in my heart because dragon nerd. <laughs> then there's Sisters of the Revolution a feminist speculative fiction anthology edited by Anne and Jeff Vandermeer. I don't agree with the feminist qualifier though. Some short stories in this collection are feminist, according to my criteria in any case. Some of them are female-centric and some of them are just unrelated. Yeah, I enjoyed it well enough, that's why I've kept it. And then there's the Florence Welsh from Florence the Machine book with all her song lyrics and some poems, Useless Magic. And then moving down to the bottom right and then bottom left these slash shelves so these are basically sff series duologies and above so we have the handmaid's tale and the testaments by of course margaret atwood followed by parable of the sower and parable of the talents written by octavia e Butler, my second favorite dystopian of all time. And then there's the Farsi trilogy written by Robin Hobb, the first trilogy in her ginormous Realm of the Elderling series. I did like Farsi, but I'm kind of burnt out on fancy series, to be perfectly honest. I just don't feel like tackling a 16 book series. That being said, you want a cool little anecdote? I once met Robin Hobb at a convention in my own freaking country, Belgium, and I did get the first book signed. So I do have a signed edition of Assassin's Apprentice. Yeah, so y'all know I'm not lying. <laughs> 
And then, well, well, like I said, I have these other Leguins that will go up at some point, but I'm kind of using them as bookends right now. So, of course, we do have The Left Hand of Darkness, my favourite science fiction novel of all time. Of course, I have a dedicated book review for that one, like, duh. Then we have The Telling, a novel set in the Ecumen as well. There's the short story collection Always to Forgiveness, which takes place on the planets Weryl, Weryl, and Yeowe. It deals quite a bit with slavery. And then there's the collection A Fisherman of the Inland Sea. That one takes place on the planet O, where they have a very interesting marital system going on and societal division system going on as well, moieties and all that. And then there's Changing Planes, another short story collection. And so we have the first two books in the Book of Dust, supposed to be a trilogy. When is book three coming? And then of course we have The Children of Time and Children of Ruin, duology to become a trilogy written by Adrian Tchaikovsky. So I will have at some point a copy of Children of Memory and also, um, yeah, I splurged and got the Broken Binding special editions, which I'll get next year, I believe. And then we have another all-time favourite fantasy series, The Winnowing Flame, written by Jen Williams. And so we have my childhood sweethearts. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna call them that, actually. My childhood, tweenhood, literary sweethearts. So we have, like I already showed, his dark materials. Did not enjoy them nearly as much as an adult. I had several issues with the characters, the world building. Not so much the theming, I don't think. But yeah, it's just very special to me. And I really freaking need to continue watching the TV adaptation because it's actually quite decent. And then we have well, Inheritance Cycle, written by Christopher Parolini, Aragon Inheritance, Eldest, and Brazinga. This was my gateway drug to SFF literature. It's very special, near and dear to me. I will always keep these copies of the books, and that's just that. And as you can see there, well, especially book one is worn quite a bit. Yeah, I've had this one since I was... 11, 12. And then we have my Harry Potter books. They're all except one. Hardbacks and then <clears throat> number six there is not of the same edition. Why? I think it's because my dad bought them actually. He would pre-order them or buy them as soon as they came out because he was a huge Harry Potter fan. I was actually read from Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone as a child and then I read them on my own. I first read them in French however and then I finished the series in English. Moving on to my second shelving unit. This is basically the shelving unit where I keep all of my my Penguin English Library editions, all my fancy Masterworks editions, and the vast majority of my science fiction Masterworks editions. This is also where I keep my Duneverse paperbacks. Downstairs I have all of my books in the Petite Bibliothèque de Savoir collection. So this is basically a series of non-fiction comic books. Each one deals with a specific topic and honestly the vast majority of them I found very very good, very informative, often with a really neat art style as well. Then I have like a few books related to erotic literature and poetry. <laughs> basically. So I do have my three novels written by the three Bronte sisters. There's The Tenant of Wildfield Hall written by Anne Bronte. There's, oh you can barely see it, but basically there's, which one is it? <laughs> Even I can't read it. Uh, it's Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, followed by Withering Heights written by Emily Bronte. Now I do plan on rereading both of those this coming year. Then there's The Heart of Darkness written by Joseph Conrad. Didn't actually like it, but you know, part of the collection. There's The Hound of the Baskervilles written by Sir Arthur Conan. Doyle. Also didn't really like it, but never mind. There is At the Mountains of Madness written by Lovecraft, which I did like. There is The Great God Pan and other stories written by Arthur C. Macon, Marken, whatever. Wasn't a super big fan of it, but you know, I wanted to explore H.P. Lovecraft's influences, which is also why I will be reading at some point The King of Elfland's Daughter written by Lord Dunsany. I do know it was a major influence on Lovecraft. Then there's Animal Farm written by, well, George Orwell once again. <laughs> yeah, Orwell just doesn't really work for me as an author. Then there's The Murders in the Rue Morgue written by Edgar Allan Poe, of course. I do have a dedicated book review for that one if you're interested. Liked it well enough though I was a wee bit disappointed because I was expecting more spoopiness. <laughs> Then there is Frankenstein, written by Mary Shelley. Then there's Dracula, written by Bram Stoker. And The Portrait of Dorian Gray, written by Oscar Wilde. I read that one a very long time ago, but I remember really liking it. I will reread that one as well at some point, but probably not next year. Then, quickly moving through the fancy masterworks, we have Little Dick, written by John Crowley. I have a dual book review for that. And Thomas the Rhymer, written by Alan Kushner. There is Mythago Wood and Lavondis, written by Robert Holstock. I also have a dual book review for 
these two and I really enjoyed them, especially Luvonda, so I'd say it's a soft fancy favourite. There is the Forgotten Beasts of Eld, written by Patricia A. McKillop, that's definitely a fancy favourite of mine. And also Ombre and Shadow, written by the same author, didn't like it as much, but still enjoyed it. And The Falling Woman, written by Pat Murphy, I also have a dedicated book review for that one. And then my shiny science fiction masterworks, I really do like them. All lined up like that though. <clears throat> this shit? Unacceptable! <laughs> Just what the... That makes me mad, actually, you know? It's one of my bookworm pet peeves, I guess. So we have Rendezvous with Rama, written by Arthur C. Clarke. I have a dual book review for that one in conjunction with Ringworld, written by Larry Niven, because they both feature the science fiction trope of the big, dumb object. We have Babel 17, written by Samuel R. Delaney. I also have a review for that one. Not a big fan. I don't remember it that well, because... I didn't like it that much. Native Tongue, written by Suzette Hayden Elgin. This is feminist science fiction. It had interesting ideas, I have to say, and I also have a review for that one. I also have a review for the following Ammonite, written by Nicola Griffith. It was kind of disappointing overall. Flowers for Algernon, written by Daniel Keyes. That is a soft all-time science fiction favourite of mine. Unquenchable Fire, written by Rachel Pollack. It's not even really science fiction, actually. Very original story, though. I've never encountered anything quite like it, but I had several issues with it as well, so a bit of a mixed bag. The Female Man, written by Joanna Russ. This is also, quote-unquote, classic feminist science fiction. There were some interesting bits in there, but not a favourite. Revelation Space, written by Alistair Reynolds. I read this this year, and I have a review for it if you're interested. Again, it was good, but disappointing at the same time. Then we have Hyperion, The Fall of Hyperion, written by Dan. Simmons. This is also another all-time top science fiction favourite of mine. Prefer those two to the first Doom trilogy. Then we have a couple of Arcady and Boris Trugatsky novels. There's Roadside Picnic and The Snail on the Slope. Don't really like either. <laughs> the Snail on the Slope is very freaking weird, but not in the way I like, if that makes sense. I mean, I love weird fiction a la Mieville or Jeff Anamir. Here was, um, nah. Not really. Roadside Picnic was interesting and I read it because I was searching for stuff similar to Annihilation back when I first read it. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting premise, but the execution was okay. Then there is More Than Human, written by Theodore Sturgeon. I also have a dedicated book review for that one. It plays around with psychic powers and gestalt humans, I wouldn't say more than that. I liked it in the beginning and then it just kind of steadily got worse. Then we have a few Sherry S. Tuppers. There's The Gate to Women's Country. I really liked it when I first read it, though there are a couple of not so good elements. I do need to reread it and this one is planned as a reread for next year. So we have the other two Sherry S. Tuppers, Glass and Living Stones. They are part of the Arby trilogy but only those two available in the Science Fiction Masterworks collection. I like them quite a bit actually and I do have a good book reading for those if you're interested. And there's Her Smoke Grows Up Forever in my James Tipley Jr. Ugh, oh, I have a dedicated book review that one if you're interested. Uh, this is a lot. And then The War of the Worlds in my H.P. Wells. I really like that one. It still holds up. And then like I said, we have my Dune verse paperbacks. Obviously I'm a fan of the original Dune trilogy. It's one of my all-time favourites. God Emperor of Dune can go throw itself in a fire. <laughs> and Harry Heretics and Chapter House were better, but not as good as the first trilogy. And these are like really pretty paperback editions, but the format is a bit wonky. I don't know. But I do like them. And so downstairs, like I said, we have this collection of non-fiction graphic novels, comic books, if you will. There's one about the universe, tattooing, history of prostitution, feminism, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That one is actually really freaking good because I didn't really know much about this topic overall. I learned a lot. We have zombies, bees, liberalism. That also was extremely eye-opening because people use the word liberal in so many different ways. There's the birth of the Bible. There's basically rules rumors and credulity, so it looks into cognitive biases and things like that, also very interesting. What about Homo sapiens and what we basically don't know about early humans? <laughs> and anarchism, which was mildly disappointing but still interesting. My favourites are probably tattooing, feminism, history of prostitution, bees, the bees one was really good, and the birth of the bible one was really good as well. Anyway, moving on to chonky anthologies about uh, erotic literature, to put it simply. There are erotic kind of fairy tales, sort of, in the first one. In the second one you have a selection of novellas, short stories, things like that. And then we have poetry stuff. So there's Penguin's Poems for Love. There is William Blake's Songs of Innocence and Experience. I do love me some William Blake. There is Le Faire du Mal, written by Charles Baudelaire. Then there's a short little French thing about the figure of Lilith. There's Rupi Kaur's The Sun and Her Flowers. Didn't think I would like that one because it's kind of free verse poetry, contemporary poetry, and I'm really not about that. I'm very traditionalist when it comes to poetry. <laughs> but I actually like that one. It was a gift from my mother. And then two books about rhymes. 
Moving on to my third shelving unit. This one is principally dedicated to non-fiction, though there's a wee bit of graphic fiction and like art books in the lower right corner. So with non-fiction books, I tend to sort by topic slash subject. So on this shelf, you have most of my books dedicated to animal cognition and relationships between humans and non-human animals. So on the left, you have a few books, well, about that, ethology, animal emotions, animal cognition, etc. Moving on to uh, <laughs> the meat of the shelf, it's burbs, because of course it's going to be burbs because I'm a burb nerd. So we have the two Jennifer Ackerman books, then there are a few books about Corvids specifically because corvids are my favorite group of birds. Then we have books which center on relationships between humans and birds. Alex and Me specifically has a very special place in my heart and is one of the books I mentioned in my 27 years of reading video. It was very important on my journey, well, just as a human being and of course as a reader and as a bird lover. And then I have a little, well, it's, it's a guidebook about taking care of conyers because I did have a conyer. Lily was a green cheek conyer. If I ever have another bird, it will undoubtedly be a conyer once again. Zipping down to the middle bottom shelf, because it's related to the other one thematically, this is more an assortment of guidebooks about the natural world, and then these little topic overview books, if you will, and also a book about first names, because I have a mild thing about name etymology, and then, you know, assortment of guidebooks, reference books, like I said, I have one for crystals, I have one for shrooms, I have one for well, I have several for birds, of course, and a few for flowering plants. And then a book I mentioned and showed recently, 50 Plants That Changed the Course of History. This is more niche history in relationship to plants. Then let's move on to the two feminism shells. This is definitely the best book I've ever read on the subject of rape culture. Then you have a few classic essays, excerpts from, well, classic works of feminist theory, Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf, brilliant essay, you have A Vindication of the Rights of Women, brilliant first wave feminist essay, really. You have excerpts from Second Sex, another classic, and also The Beauty Myth by Naomi Wolf. And then, well, this is basically my collection about gender, broadly speaking. Uh, this absolute classic that I will always love, it has a very special place in my heart as well, because it's the first book of its kind I ever read. This, Invisible Women, is an absolute brilliant book about the issues posed by the lack of sex-specific data in a variety of fields. And then this is basically a book about the manosphere. And then of course my two gender critical books. And then the second feminism and feminism adjacent shelf contains a few books about what I'll perhaps a bit oversimplistically call the origins of what we call patriarchy or what I prefer to call androcracy really. Then we have a couple of books about female-centric history and prehistory, so Lady Sapiens is about prehistory specifically, then it slowly moves into, well, human sexuality, kind of, though it's still in the domain of feminism, broadly speaking, with the wise wound and Aphrodite's daughters. The wise wound takes a look at the archetypal symbolic aspects of menstruation, if I recall correctly. I read this a long time ago. Same kind of goes with this one. This is about sacred sexuality, but from a female-centric perspective. And then, well, we have Sex at Dawn. I don't think it's garbage like a lot of people. I don't think it's amazing like a lot of people. Then we have Bonk. <laughs> I love that title. Bonk! Written by Mary Roach. Then a book about polyamory. And then a few books about erotic arts and erotic literature and sexuality throughout history. And continuing on with my two mythology pagan religion psychedelics shells, basically. This one is firmly on the side of mythology and pagan religions, general mythology books, then books that go into specific mythologies, and then books about goddess worship generally, or more precisely about certain goddesses like Inanna slash Ishtar, and then a couple of books, one about Druidry, and the second one is a Ronald Hutton book, as I've recently shown. I have two others on my physical TBR. I really, really enjoyed The Triumph of the Moon, which is a book about the history of neo-paganism in Great Britain. And then next to that, well, okay, I have two books here which I guess are psychology related, psychology adjacent. That's kind of why they go with the psychedelic ones. And then yeah, we move into the psychedelics 
spirituality stuff. I do have Ralph Waldo Emerson's Nature. I do remember loving that essay at the time I read it. I do have Aldous Huxley's The Doors of Perception. So that's the account of what happened when he tripped on masculine. And so yeah, those are the books I have dedicated to psychedelics, psychedelic science and medicine proper. Dreaming Wide Awake is more about the intersection between psychedelics, dreaming, lucid dreaming, just altered states of consciousness more generally. And then yeah, those are the more spiritual books. Yearning for the Wind, Fire in the Head is more about Celtic spirituality. And these two are related to shamanism because I do also have an interest in shamanism. And those little books, I basically bought all of those the year I visited Stonehenge and Averyhenge. And so yeah, there's a lot about Stonehenge and Sacred Springs and Glastonbury and, you know, nature spirits. I think I, yeah, there's one about Avery Henge. And so on the bottom right shelf, I stacked, well, my two ongoing graphic novel series, Monstrous and Saga. And then, yeah, a few art books. The Sleep of Reason is an anthology of horror comics. Pretty good, actually. A book about erotic art. And then, yeah, a few art books. I have one about fairies and goddesses, one about female shamans. I did feature that one on my channel in one of my reading wrap-ups. An art book called Merlin, which I've also talked about before. It's my favorite art book of all time. And then two art books about dragons. Moving on to my fourth and penultimate shelving unit. So this one has, as you can see, three shelves. The upper one basically features all of my big formatted non-fiction books. The bottom one hosts all of my basically graphic novels, bon dessinée as we call them in French, comic books, etc. Except, you know, for the few I showed previously in the other shelving unit. It. And that middle shelf <laughs> showcases my special slash deluxe editions of some literary favourites. And finally, my fifth shelf is basically my physical TBR shelf, lodged within my gaming station. <laughs> Because yes, I do have one now. As you can see, there's my PS4 with a few games. And yeah, I actually completely forgot. <laughs> I still have my physical copy of Lost Gods. I need to unhaul that one. But um, yeah, I legitimately forgot it was there. So yeah, taking a closer look, I actually did a book haul in my last reading wrap up. I talked about my trip to London and all the goodies I got there. So yeah, this is my physical TBR shelf. So all these will be read if, well, definitely not all of them this year. I will read them next year, most definitely, because I do prioritize physical books. As if you want to take a look there, <laughs> it's a I mean, like video game. Bloodborne, Horizon Zero Dawn, Dark Souls 3, which I have beaten, just to be very clear, and Elden Ring, which I have not beaten. Technically, I haven't even finished Bloodborne, but um, Lady Maria, she be a bitch. <laughs> Am I right? Also, Horizon Zero Dawn, I haven't actually played it. I really need to, because I think it's a game I would like, but um, I really got sucked down the source book rabbit hole, let's be real. I'm going to leave off here. I hope you found this, uh, well, as usual, engaging, interesting. Once again, if you have any questions about any of the books you saw during this video, feel free to ask them in the comments down below or on the Discord server. There is a link for it, again, in the description box down below. And also, to reward those of you who stayed until the end of the video, here's a little clip of my baby dinosaur.